that you've given us to rise out of our beds of slumber to see this day with reasonable health of our strength of our minds and our bodies to sing praises and give all honor and glory to thee we gather together in love to worship and praise and adore you and thy son whom you sent to die for us we pray that all things said and done during this time of praise and worship raised to you will be in thy name and according to thy will these favors and blessings we ask in thy dear son's name. Amen. i 
searching from afar. Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse number 1 and reading through verse number 6. Paul the Apostle writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed by this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, though the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Most gracious and merciful Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We are humbled and thankful that you've allowed us this time and this space to worship you this day and praise you this hour and the fellowship that we have with you and each other through that dear Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. We're thankful for your grace and your mercy. We are thankful for just bountifully blessing us, allowing us to see the light of this day. We ask that you will continue to keep us in thy love through this time of worship, and as we go through the days, weeks, and months ahead, if it be thy will. We ask that you will continue to bless our health, and we ask a special blessing for the health of those who are hampered, by physical illness and emotional despair. We ask that you would bless thy word that is surely to be brought before us. We ask that you will bless it in such a way that it may bless and edify your church, that it may stir someone's heart who may need to be restored, that it may stir the heart of someone who knows not your son, that they may turn their life anew and their life over to Christ. Continue to guide us through this day and this time of worship unto you. It is this we ask in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. I keep falling in love with you. Oh.
Michigan. To our visitors, we're so glad that you have joined us this morning, and we do consider you as our honored guest. And it's our prayer this morning that your visit with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying, and that you will want to join us again because you have benefited by joining us this morning. We extend to you an open invitation to all of our activities of the Church of Christ at Northside, whether in the digital realm or the physical. And wherever you find yourself able and available, just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you possibly can. It's a true saying that God has really blessed us, that he's really been good to us. And it's evidenced by the fact that for one more time, you are on this side of the timeline of life. God has woke us up this morning. He's showered us with all of his blessings. And if you ever want evidence of the fact that you are blessed, just consider that for at least one more moment that you are on this side of the timeline of life and that you are being seen and not being viewed. I'm going to ask that you pray with me and then we'll be into our lesson for the morning. God of love, we come before you this morning. Father God, first of all, just to give you thanks. We have so much to be thankful for. We have all of the blessings that you so graciously and bountifully shower upon us each and every moment of our lives. We have a relationship with you that you have taken us into your family, that you have given us the adoption of sons and made us sit as heirs with our elder brother, Christ Jesus. God, our Father, we just come to you right now, just so thankful. And God, right now, we pray that as we go into this message for the morning, that all hearts and minds that are gathered here are receptive to your word, that they will find within your word those things that they may need to live out their lives in a way that's pleasing to you and that their lives will bring you all the glory and honor. And God, right now, as it befalls me, I pray that you will keep me behind the cross, that it's not my words, but it's your words that I heard, that it's not my will that is done, but your will, that through all of our efforts here, you may be glorified. This is our prayer right now in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'm going to ask that you will uh, uh, direct your attention to the 12th chapter of the book of Romans. Romans, the 12th chapter. And we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 6. Romans chapter 12. Beginning at verse number one and reading through verse number six, Paul the Apostle writes, I beseech you therefore, brethren, 
by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed by this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, though the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Someone once wisely said that the idolatry of individualism in our culture has influenced even the way we think about our spiritual growth. So much of the teaching on spiritual formation is self-centered and self-focused without any reference to our relationship to God and to other people. And this is completely unbiblical, and it ignores much of the New Testament. The truth of the matter is this. Christians need relationships to grow. We don't grow in isolation. We develop in the context of fellowship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was murdered for resisting Nazis, wrote a classic on fellowship that was called Life Together. And in this work, he suggests that disillusionment with local church is a good thing. Why? because it destroys our false expectations of perfection. He goes on to say the sooner that we give up the illusion that a church must be perfect in order to love it, the sooner we'll quit pretending and start admitting that we're all imperfect and we need grace. And this is the beginning of real community. He goes on to say further that he who loves his dream of community more than the Christian community itself becomes a destroyer of the latter. If we don't give thanks daily for the Christian fellowship in which we have been placed, even when there is no great experience or no discoverable riches, but much uh, weakness and, and small faith and difficulty. But if on the contrary, we keep complaining that everything is paltry and petty, then we hinder God from letting our fellowship grow. And from Romans 12, I, I want to deal with uh, developing a healthy fellowship. Uh, 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 and we want to, before we even go into Romans 12, let me say this. We've already in this series defined the way to live from a Christian perspective by understanding discipleship which is the process of being a lifelong learner and follower of Christ, determined to go where he goes and do what he does and say what he says. We've defined the way to live from a Christian perspective through understanding worship, the spiritual, intellectual, and emotional response to who God is and what God does 
having God as the, as the focus of worship. And today I want us to understand the way to live through fellowship. And this is defined as one of our purposes for living, fellowship. And as we live for discipleship, and as we live for worship, we have the chance to fellowship in an isolated and a lonely world. But why do we talk about fellowship? Are we not fellowshipping in the church today? Have we come to the place uh, that coming together is more important than staying apart? Have relationships among people become more complicated or less complicated? Because I believe that as a society, we have become married to escapism tactics like TV and chat rooms and video games, periodic church attendance to avoid coming together. And the world's theme of self-absorption has even invaded the body of Christ. You see it now with all of its emphasis placed on who's going to help me, getting what's mine, my destiny, my vision, my call. And we act as though all of that operates in a vacuum apart from the whole of what God is doing. Understand me this morning, fellowship is vital. As Hezekiah Walker rightly declared, I need you and you need me. We all are a part of God's body. We need each other because the best of us can get spiritually dull. The best of us sometimes want to throw in the towel. The best of us sometimes fall flat on our faces. Paul put it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he falls. Because falling is right around the corner. And I, 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 let me, let me define fellowship real quick. I've, I've tarried long enough and then we'll move into the text. I'm defining fellowship this morning this way. The opportunity to share our lives with others in order to strengthen and encourage and build one another up through Jesus Christ. The opportunity to share our lives with others in order to strengthen, encourage, and build one another up through Jesus Christ. And in doing this, I want us to look at three things this morning that are woven through the entire chapter of Romans 12. And the first thing we find woven here in this chapter is the idea of fellowshipping with the Savior. Look with me again at verses 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we grow and as we mature as believers, we will find that fellowship is vital to living. To be more specific, fellowship with our Savior is the key to real living. For which one of us will decide that today is not a good day to walk with the Lord? Which of us in here will declare that tomorrow that is not a good day to walk with God? God 
has sought to commune or to get with his people for a very long time. It's been his desire to be involved in our lives regularly and consistently. Go all the way back to Leviticus chapter 26 and verse 12, where he says, I will also walk among you and be your God and you shall be my people. Jesus says this in John chapter 14, verse number 23. All those who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come to them and live with them. God was so committed to fellowship with us that he came and he occupied a temporary body like ours to help us see an even greater way to have fellowship with him and the Father. John tells us this in John 1.14. I'm going to put it the way the Message Bible says it. And Christ became a human being and lived here on earth among us and was full of loving forgiveness and truth. And some of us have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son of the Heavenly Father. Put all this together, and it goes like this. You were made to fellowship with God. God did not make you and then step away from you to leave you alone. No more than a mother who carries a child for nine months gives birth and just walks away. Fellowship occurs. Nurturing takes place. Love is experienced and life is enjoyed. So what do I do in response to all that God has done for me? I fellowship with him. But the question this morning is how do I fellowship with the Savior? Think about the text this morning. Verses 1 and 10 tells us that we give him our bodies, our minds, and our wills. We give him our bodies, our minds, and our wills. First of all, you give him your body. Paul says in verse number one that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. Now that's important that we give him our bodies. Because before we trusted him, we used our body for any and everything. But now that we belong to God, we want to use our body for his glory. Paul says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And that verb present in this verse carries the tense that means to present once and for all. It commands a definite commitment to the body of the body to God, just as a bride and a groom in their wedding service commit themselves to each other. And it's the right response for all that God has done for us. See, we can't want to be where he is. And Paul helps us to understand that giving God our bodies in fellowship is also our worship. He says it's our reasonable service, which translates in more modern versions to our spiritual worship. This means that every day is a worship experience when your body is yielded to the Lord. Every day is a fellowship experience when you yield your body to him. But Paul also lets us know that we're to give him our minds. He says, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Understand this morning, the world wants to control your mind. But God wants to transform it. And that word transform is the same word we find in Matthew uh, chapter 17, verse 2, where we, he sees transfigure. It's 
where we, uh, it's that Greek word where we get our English word metamorphosis. It's a change from within. The world wants to change your mind, so it exerts pressure from without. But the Holy Spirit changes your mind by releasing his power from within. See, if the world controls your thinking, you're a conformer. But if God controls your thinking, if God controls your mind, you are a transformer. And he transforms our minds and he makes us more spiritually minded by using his word. But then we also see that we need to give him our will. Paul ending verse two, he says that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Your mind controls your body and your, your, your will controls your mind. And many people think they can control their will by willpower. But let me tell you something, that will eventually fail. But what Paul tells us that we need to do is to surrender our will to God. And as we spend time in prayer, and we surrender our will to God and pray with the Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. And we pray about everything. We'll let God have his way in everything connected with our lives. I can have unbroken fellowship with the Savior by giving him my body and my mind and my will. But not only... Does Paul deal with fellowshipping with the Savior? He also talks about fellowshipping with the saints. Beginning at verse number three, Paul says this. For, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, According as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. I'm going to stop right there. For right now. But I want you to see this. When saints are communing with Jesus Christ, the dynamic of our fellowship with Christ will automatically overflow into our relationships with other believers. Let me say that again. When saints are communing with Christ, the dynamics of this fellowship with Christ will automatically overflow into our relationships with other believers. Let me put it simply. Our horizontal fellowship with each other is simply an overflow of our vertical relationship and fellowship with Christ. That means this. If your relationship with God doesn't overflow into caring about God's people, you ain't as close to God as you thought you were. If your union with God has not produced a communion with God that overflows to the benefit of others, you aren't as spiritual as you thought you were. If a believer comes to church week after week after week, takes in the word of God, yet nobody benefits from what God is doing in his or her life, then she or he is a carnal, out of fellowship saint. So how do I have fellowship with the saints? Paul here was writing to Christians 
who were members of a local body in Rome. He describes their relationship to each other in terms of the members of a body. And the basic idea that he's attempting to get across is that each believer is a living part of the body. Each believer has gifts or abilities to be used for the building up of the body and the perfecting or the maturing of the other members of the body. In short, we belong to each other. You thought you was yours, didn't you? No, 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 no. You belong to God and you belong to the other members of the body. And we're to minister or to serve each other. And we need each other. And, and there's some essentials for spiritual ministry and growth in the body of Christ. Let me give you those and we'll be done for the morning. First of all, there's an honest evaluation. Look at what Paul says again at verse 3. He says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. I heard it once put this way by another preacher concerning ourselves. We all formerly had hard hearts, stiff necks, feet swift to mischief, dull ears, blinded eyes, throats that were open graves, tongues full of deceit, poison under our lips, dead spirits, unclean hands, self-centered, sin-seeking, held hostage individuals, but God. All of that was you. Paul tells us the same thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But God. I need you to grasp this this morning. There is nothing more harmful to the body of Christ than those of us who overrate or overestimate ourselves. The same cross that was needed to get me into Christ was the same one that was needed to get you in. The same blood that was shed for my sins, no matter how many, was the same blood needed to get, uh, to be shed for your sins, no matter how few. The same Jesus that saved me from how far I was down was the same Jesus that saved you no matter how far up you were. We came in this world with nothing. We're going out with nothing. And whatever we've been given between those two points came from God by his grace. And they ought to be used for God's glory. Not only must there be an honest evaluation if we're going to have fellowship with, us, with each other, but there also has to be honest cooperation. Y'all remember that song by the OJs, and don't act like you've been saved all your life. That song by the OJs that had lyrics that went something like this. I got what you want. You got what I want. And we were made for each other. That sums up what our fellowship ought to be about right there. I got what you want. You got what I want. I got what you need. You got what I need. We were made for each other. Each one of us has been given something to do to help build one another up. But it won't happen if we're not connecting. Our abilities, our gifts, our tools that God gave us to build with. Not toys to play with or, or, or weapons to fight with. We have to have an honest cooperation 
with each other. We have to connect to each other. We have to become more open to each other if we're going to have a true fellowship with each other. We have to move from an honest evaluation to an honest cooperation to an honest participation. Look at what Paul says beginning at verse number nine. He says, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love and honor preferring one another, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of the saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that do weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, and be not wise in your own conceits. What is Paul saying here? Here in these verses, he focuses on the attitude with which we do things. He reminds the Roman Christians and he reminds us by extension that we must enter into the feelings of others. Christian fellowship is more than a pat on the back and a, and, and a handshake. Christian fellowship is more than just standing around after the worship assembly talking and gabbing. Christian fellowship is more than going over to the fellowship wing and eating fried chicken with each other. It means sharing the burdens and the blessings of others so that we all can grow together and glorify God. And if Christians can't get along with one another, how can they ever face the enemy Satan? a humble attitude, and a willingness to share are the marks of a Christian who truly ministers to or serves the body. Taking care of one another and looking after one another is literally saturated throughout the scriptures. Fellowship, in essence, was meant to be a way of life. And over 50 times in the New Testament, the phrase one another or each other is used. We're told to love each other, pray for each other, encourage each other, admonish each other, greet each other, serve each other, Teach each other, accept each other, honor each other, bear each other's burdens, forgive each other, sing to each other, submit to each other, on and on and on. We see each other or one another in scripture. The great difference between those who just attend and, and the members of a true body is centered on that word commitment. There can be no true fellowship with other people if there is no true commitment to other Christians. It's like the difference between couples who just live together and those who get married. It's a commitment thing. And when becoming a Christian means committing yourself to Christ, becoming a, 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 a true fellowshipping member of the body means to commit yourselves to other Christians. One person put it this way. He defined fellowship as being committed to each other as much as we are committed to Christ. 
And it's so important that the New Testament gives more attention to the unity of the body than to either heaven or hell. What does that mean? It means God desires us to experience oneness and harmony with each other. And what Paul focuses in on verses 3 through 16 here is to help us to see that we should focus on what we share in common. We're to be realistic in our expectations uh, uh, with each other. And let me say something briefly about that. Is See, once we discover what God intends real fellowship to be, it's easy to become discouraged by the gap between the idea and the real in the body. But however, we must passionately love the body in spite of the imperfections within the different members in the body. Longing for the idea while criticizing the real is immaturity. Settling for the real without striving for the idea is complacency. But real maturity in our fellowship is living with the tension between the perfect and the imperfect, or the idea and the real. In essence, we need to be patient with each other, making allowances for each other's fault because of your love. Because the real is this. Believers are going to disappoint you. Believers are going to let you down. But that's no excuse to stop fellowshipping them. They're your family, even when they don't act like it, and you just don't walk out on them. People become disillusioned for many understandable reasons, and that's a quite lengthy list. But being, uh, rather than being shocked and, and surprised, we must remember that the body, the church, is made up of real sinners, including us. And because we're sinners, we hurt each other, sometimes intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. But instead of leaving, we need to stay and work it all out together. Understand this. Walking away at the first sign of disappointment or disillusionment shows immaturity. God has things he wants you to learn and he has things he wants others to learn. And besides, there's no perfect church to escape to. Then the things that God wants us to learn and to teach comes out of that fellowship. And, and grasp this. If you could find a perfect church to run to, the minute you got there, it would be imperfect. Every church, everybody has its own set of weaknesses and problems. And no matter where you go, you'll soon be disappointed again. Comedian Groucho Marx was famous for saying he wouldn't want to belong to any club that would let him in. And the same is true with the body. If the church must be perfect to satisfy you, that same perfection would exclude you from its borders because you're not perfect. So we need to focus in on what we share in common and be realistic in our expectations with each other and choose to encourage rather than criticize and refuse to, to, to listen to gossip and practice God's rules for conflict resolution and support those in the body. Those are the things 
that will strengthen our fellowship with each other. Our fellowship includes fellowshipping with the Savior. That's our vertical fellowship, our up and down fellowship. And it, it also includes a horizontal fellowship or fellowshipping with the saints. The Apostle John put it this way very clearly in 1 John chapter 1, verse 3. He says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye may also have fellowship with us. That's the horizontal. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the vertical. Our vertical fellowship ought to overflow into our horizontal fellowship. And that's what true and real fellowship in the body should look like. How shall we now live? Part of that equation is the fellowship that we ought to have with God and with each other. Remember our definition that we shared at the beginning, where fellowship was the opportunity to share our lives with others in order to strengthen and encourage and build one another up through Jesus Christ. And that's what our true fellowship looks like. And if others aren't being encouraged, if others aren't being strengthened, if others aren't built, being built up by your actions, then you don't have true fellowship with each other. And you can't have true fellowship with God and not have true fellowship with God's people message is yours this morning. And I hope somebody was encouraged and edified by God's word today. And if you're a child of God this morning and you find yourself falling short in, 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 in your relationship with God and or with God's people, now is the time to turn it around. Whatever your need is, God just says, bring it to him. Lay it on the altar. Repent of whatever that shortcoming or that fall is. And God is faithful and just to restore and forgive. Whether it's a shortfall in fellowship, saints, or a shortfall in any other area of your Christian life, put it on the altar this morning and watch God forgive and restore and strengthen that area of your life. If you're not a child of God this morning, the first thing you need is a right relationship or a right fellowship with God. God loved you so much that he sent his son, Christ Jesus, to die so that you could be reconciled back to him so that you could be adopted back into the family of God. And get me this morning. If Christ was willing to die for you, shouldn't you be willing to live for him? Well, preacher, how do I live for Christ? I'm so glad you asked. Let me give you the beginning of that journey. You've heard his word. You've heard how he came and how he died for your sins. Believe what you've heard. Be willing to repent of all of your sins. That means you turn away from them and now you turn toward Christ. Be willing to confess. That means that you stand in agreement with the fact that Jesus indeed is the Christ and he's God's son. And be willing to be buried in baptism for the remission of all of your sins. And if you do that this morning, that starts you on your relationship, your right relationship, your right fellowship with God. And if you live in that relationship, one day heaven will be your home. What's your need this morning? What's your desire this morning? Let us know by reaching out to us at the contact information that appears on your screen. 
And whether it's prayer, we'll pray with you. Whether it's a need for reconciliation and restoration, we'll aid you on that journey. If you need to be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins this morning, we'll make that happen immediately. If you'll just reach out to us, whether it's by the email address or by the phone number, we'll reach out to you and make it happen immediately. The message is yours. And at this time, we're going to turn the services back over to those who are charged with facilitating them further. God loves you. And we at the Church of Christ at Northside do too. of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he break it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner also he took the cup when he had a sup saying this cup is the new testament in my blood this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me for as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh that nation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as you allowed us once again to approach your throne of grace, we ask, Father, that our minds be fixed upon Christ and all that he has done for us. We ask, Father, that as we take these symbols of his shed blood and broken body, we do so with the proper heart. In Jesus' name, we pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen. The Lord, he's omnipotent. Ooh, and we bless his name. Let all the people praise him. All saints proclaim that. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11.
Dear Heavenly Father, we once again approach your magnificent throne of grace. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to come together to worship you. We pray, Father, that while we are still absent from one another, we ask, Father, that you just keep our minds and spirits up. We pray, Father, that we remember to call one another and to encourage one another. Thank you for all that you have given us. And let us learn to count our blessings more than we count our troubles. In Jesus' name and in the Spirit's name, we pray. This ends our worship service online broadcast for today. We thank you for tuning in. And again, we hope that you were blessed in some way by joining us. We invite you each and every Sunday at 1030 a.m. as well as our other weekday Bible study and prayer broadcast that are scheduled during this time. We continue to pray for your health and safety. We are located at 18460 Conant Avenue in the city of Detroit. Be blessed.